Grow CFO is where finance leaders grow together. Join thousands of like-minded professionals using Grow CFO to access the combined knowledge and experience of the finance leader community. You can join us today at growcfo.net. Hello and welcome to the Grow CFO show. I'm your host, Kevin Appleby. And as I'm recording this, it's just coming up to Christmas, but you're probably listening to this in January or early February next year. And my guest today is Wasia Kamon. And we're going to talk about a lot of things. We're going to talk about Wasia and how she got to where she is now, but we're also going to talk about you know, objectives for next year, how you can be a better you, and all a whole range of topics that, that Wasia is interested in. So, Wasia, hello and welcome to the Grow CFO Show. Hi, Kevin. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So tell me about you. Gosh. So I'm Wasia. I'm currently the VP of Finance and Accounting at ACM Chemistries. It's a company based in Norcross, Georgia, in the Atlanta metro area. Okay. And that's what I do at work, at home. I'm a wife, mom of two. I love chocolate. I love having fun. It's that time of the year. For at least it's when we're recording chocolate, it. All right. yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm also very active on LinkedIn. I'm a career strategist, and I've been helping accounting and finance professionals fast track their career. So making sure they make the right investment in themselves so they can advance really quickly in their careers. So hang on a minute. Mm -hmm. There are only 24 hours in a day. Yes. And you're a a VP of finance. Uh You're a mentor. You're a strategist. You're the treasurer of a charity. Yes. Your wife, a mum of two. Yes. It's time to eat chocolate. <laughs> There's chocolate everywhere. <laughs> yes, yes. I think that it's a matter of being organized. And when you are motivated to do things, you just find time for it. Yeah. And okay. I always find time for chocolate. Always. Always. It's the most important one of the lot, isn't it? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about being VP of finance and accounting. And VP of something isn't really a title that we have in the UK or in Europe. It's very much a United States sort of title. What exactly does a VP of finance and accounting do? So it's pretty much a CFO, the closest things to a CFO, because I report directly to the CEO where I am. Right. So it's in charge of everything, finance and accounting operations, and also relationships with other vendors and key partners like the banks, you know, insurance, commercial, health insurance, and all that good stuff. So anything that have a dollar sign, pretty much. So finance is you, and that title could just as easily be CFO as it could be VP of finance. Yeah. Yes, pretty yes. much. Yeah. yeah. So how did you get to that role? Now, tell us a little bit about the, the journey that you took to get there. So I'm originally from a country called Ivory Coast, on the West African coast. And I came to the U.S. at the age of 17, uh, wanting to be a risk management or actuary person. And then I took my first statistic class and I was like, nope, I'm not going to do that. And I took my first accounting class and I was like, yes, that's what I'm going to do. So I did a couple internships in audit and then at PwC and then in tax, didn't like public accounting. And that's when I switched into the corporate accounting and finance world. And that's where I've been since. So I started as a staff accountant, grew all the way to controller, did a lot, did some FBNA as well, because at the place where I was being a controller, I built out the FPN function because it wasn't there, it was a technology company growing pretty quickly. So I established that there and then decided, oh, I want to do 100% FPNA. And so oh. went into a uh, full FPNA role at a pharmaceutical company. Then I was like, oh, I miss accounting. So then I got to be VP of finance and accounting. So I get to do both. Mm. So chemical manufacturer. What yes. sort of chemicals? So we make the admixture that goes into concrete to right. make the bricks cut water resistant and less prone to color fading. So they retain the colors longer. Ah, ah. So a fairly bulk product, but with a very specialist use. And yes. that, that reminds me of my background is chemicals as well. I spent 10 years working for... Well, a company that used to be number one on the FTSE 100 index, ICI, doesn't exist anymore. But back in a former life, I was a European business account for ICI's plastics business. 
And oh, though okay. that felt like bulk product, we made an awful lot of specialist grades. Uh, uh-huh. We had a compounding business that made specialist plastics for cars under bonnet applications, plastic oh. trim for inside the car that was scratch resistant and things like that. It was it was a fascinating business. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So at work, you're the VP of finance. So what makes you want to get out of bed in the morning? Oh gosh, everything. I have so many interests. And that's something I learned during COVID was you can't be fully fulfilled if there is only like one, if you only focus on like your job, it's hard to be fulfilled overall. Like you have to have various interests to keep you waking up, you know, in the morning and be excited. Um, So for me, I work is all the great project. We're working on ERP implementations. We're working on different automations. The company is growing. So I'm excited about being part of that. And then I get, you know, during the day, I get to be able to interact with people on LinkedIn sometimes. And then in the evening, I have different, different things I do throughout the, throughout the night uh, where I meet with my mentees or we have board meetings uh, once a month with the charity I volunteer with. So lots of things going on. So every morning there there is something to wake up for. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you came to the United States as a Mm -hmm. teenager from Ivory Coast. Yes. Was this your first language? No, French is my first language because the, the official language in Ivory Coast is French. It was a former French colony. Right. And so that was an interesting adjustment. Absolutely <laughs> fluent in English. And Thank you. if I didn't know those facts, I'd be saying you're you're a native born American. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I love to talk in my native language. So I guess uh, it kind of helped. Yeah, <laughs> going to another one because when you're an extrovert in one, you'll be an extrovert in, in the other one. So I think it helps you. Yeah. So coming into the United States from Africa at 17 mm-hmm. and English not your first language, mm-hmm. what, what sort of problems have you faced and and battled through? Oh gosh, a lot. <laughs> Don't even know where to start. So back it back home, we have to take like a second language when you're in middle school and high school. And so English was the second language I took. So I knew a little bit how to write, but I couldn't speak because, again, my teacher is French and he's teaching me in French how to say the road. So that was interesting. So my coming here, it was first to understand when people were talking to me. And also the math, the metric systems versus the pound systems, all these things in math were different. So I had to adjust to the way people spoke. I had to adjust to numbers and math, how it's done here versus overseas. I had to adjust to different stereotypes as well, because back home, I was a majority, right? I come to the US, I'm a minority. So getting adjusted to that as well, and just the way things work, you want that is is different from where I'm from. So adjusting to the way of life, the way of thinking was definitely uh, an interesting adventure, as I like to say. Yes. I know that one of one of your key topics that you enjoy is is helping women develop as leaders. So tell me a little bit more about that. It's because I had to go through it myself. And a lot of things I will share on LinkedIn or help my mentees with is from the perspective of be the mentor, I wish I had, because I didn't have much of a role model to follow. I didn't much have somebody to speak into me and let me know, okay, this is how you should do this or that. So a lot of the things I learned were learned the hard way, which I don't yeah. think it should be given the amount of information and things that are out there now. So for that, because being a woman is very different than being a man both in life and at work, right? And so, for example, I was uh, reading in an article that they said, if a woman is in a room and she's the minority, so let's say there is 10 people in the room and there's only two women, they're 70% more likely not to speak up. And as we know, if you are not speaking up during a meeting, not adding anything, you're not visible. And if you're not visible, you will likely not have much impact. So it's really helping my female sisterhood, to be able to speak up, to let our voice heard, let our perspective be understood as well. So we can make a difference in what we do, because we do have a lot of things in our head. It doesn't always come out. 
and that's often the reason we we get past on certain things. So, so Wesley, I, I, I really can't mind. imagine you in that situation being quiet. Oh I mean, gosh, I've, I've, me I've neither. Only met you for fifteen minutes, and I already I already get the picture that uh, just being one of a small number of women in a room isn't going to shut you up. <laughs> Oh, well, see, and that's what imposter syndrome does. And I was surprised with myself. So when I started at PwC, I was an intern. I was surprised, like I'm an extrovert. Everybody knows meeting me for 30 seconds. You know, this girl talks too much. And so I walked in the room and I couldn't talk. I was almost paralyzed by being sometimes the only black person in the room or being the only woman in the room or feeling like I didn't have what it took. And mind you, I graduated 4.0 summa cum laude from my university. I know this stuff. But being in that almost, it paralyzes you. It doesn't matter if you're extrovert or introvert. There are certain things that you have to overcome in your mind to really brought the full you to your workplace. So tell me a little bit more about that. Things to overcome in your mind. Yes. So remember how I said women could be 70% less likely to speak in a meeting if they were feeling like a minority in the group. That's something that happens in your mind because you would rather just listen and sometimes think that maybe the other person knows more or the other person is more senior or maybe my ideas will not be accepted. That That's all happening in your mind. Right. So it's something that you have to overcome and be comfortable in your skin to say, I'm still going to speak my mind. You know, it doesn't matter if I've, I've been at the company for one year or 15 years. It doesn't matter if I'm head of sales or not the head of sales. I still want to make a change. I have something that's valuable to share and I'm going to share it regardless of what's around me. So it's really something that comes, unfortunately, with time it came for me. But with coaching and mentoring, it's something that you can actually overcome faster. Mm. So if that's spoken to somebody on the in our audience and they're, they're mm-hmm. recognizing themselves as that person, if, if they were going to come along to you well, I see, and ask for help, where would you start? Mm-hmm. I'll start by have them, having them list the list of their strengths, right? What do people say about you? versus what you think about who you are and making sure that you always have a clear picture of what you can bring to the table. Because what often happens is we magnify the things we're lacking. So in my example, my case, when I started in corporate accounting, I was a staff accountant and I was doing, I was billing customers. And every now and then I'll help my senior accountant with inventory. One day the senior accountant quit. And the CFO came and she was like, oh, do you know about inventory? And I was like, uh, uh, I helped. I don't know if I can do it. I was doubting myself. So she was like, okay, I think we need to hire somebody else, right? Because this person doesn't seem like they're confident in, in doing this because I have all these things in my mind that maybe I haven't done the full spectrum or, you know, I'm nervous. And so all these things in your mind, they show up in how you speak. They show up on you know how you portray yourself or describe the things you can do. Come to find out, I literally was doing everything. I just didn't know about it. I knew how to do this. So I was promoted to senior accountant later on. But it was that whole process of if you don't know your strengths and what you bring to the table, you will sell your sh- yourself short of a lot of opportunities. So start with the self and the perception people have of you, but making sure you are confident with what you already know. Yeah. Stepping in the, into a position like that where, where someone's quit and you couldn't start doing the job, I suppose some of the imposter syndrome comes just from a fear of failure? Yes. Yes. The fear of not being enough. The fear of not knowing enough. And then it's made worse when others are like, well, she's been here only a couple months, a couple, you know, not even a year. How is she going to do it? So the people around you will doubt you for sure. And then if you doubt yourself, it's only going to make things worse. So it's good in that sense to have a good support system. And at the time, I wish I had a good mentor to like push me and tell me, yes, you can do it. All I could do was coming home to my husband and cry, literally cry <laughs> as I was going through the whole process. And 
there is one very good reason if if you're listening to this and you've never had a mentor before that is one very very good reason to have a mentor fine you go home to your husband you get a lot of support Mm -hmm. he's not experienced that situation as a finance person in an organization Mm -hmm. the beauty about a mentor particularly one of our mentors in grow cfo is they'll have done senior finance roles before chances are they'll have been through all of the situations that you've been in they'll have accepted a job at some point that was totally outside their comfort zone Mm -hmm. they'll have felt all of that imposter syndrome and Mm -hmm. now just having that extra resource to tap into is so so powerful oh yes definitely game changer yeah yeah Getting a mentor is not a sign of weakness. It's the way to no. win. Oh, gosh. Yes. <laughs> totally agree with you, Kevin. Yes. Yeah. 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 So uh, uh, just moving on a little bit. I, I know that another of the topics you enjoy talking about is, is influencing. Yes. Now, influencing. A lot of the roles we've been talking about there were before you became VP Finance, when you had less authority. Mm-hmm. And, How do you influence without necessarily having authority? So that usually happened when you work in a matrix kind of organization. So when I was at Beringer Ingelheim, the pharmaceutical company I worked for in FP&A role, I was the finance person, but I was supporting different business units. Mm. So the people I was working with were not my employees. I was a support partner. I was a business partner to them. Okay. So when I was making recommendations, they can take it, they cannot take it. Right. They don't have to. Like if we own a project and I'm leading some type of implementation for, because I I did something for a FPE tool where we were going to have, well, you can have a meeting, but people may not be engaged. Why would it be engaged? It's your project. How do you motivate and reward people that don't report to you? You're not doing their performance reviews. You're asking them to show up when they already have a busy schedule. And so these are part of how you learn to influence without authority because you're a business partner. You're trying to stir the business in the right decision, but you're not the boss of the head of sales. You're not the boss of the head of marketing. (laughs) Definitely not over HR. So It's really how you learn to put yourself in their shoes, speak their language, understand the challenges, and how your recommendation come to match them. So then when you make your recommendation, they will listen and actually act on it. Right. Yeah. And so in Grow CFO, we've got the business partnering bootcamp that goes into a whole load of the things that Wazir just mentioned in a lot of depth. seven two-hour workshops over over three or four months and really opens up all of that because business partnering thing as you say is is tricky you're Mm -hmm. in there you got the information you've got Mm -hmm. the analysis but Mm -hmm. how do you take that information and influence the decisions that are coming out and folks don't like being told what to do they don't like being given recommendations do they Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when you're shedding the light on something they're wasting money on or yeah. should not be doing. As long as you're in their line, like that's what we want. They're fine. When you come against it, that's when all the fun starts. No. Yeah. 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 So I guess in the in your FP&A role, you must have mm-hmm. done a lot of business partnering. Yes. Yes. I didn't have the big title. I was part of the finance team. Right. And so being able to navigate those relationships and get buy in on different things. So I was coordinating, for example, the budget. Right. So you have to meet with the different pers- the different people over technical sales or marketing and then technical service. So you have to meet with all these different leaders to come with a budget for the whole business units. And so putting that information together, getting them to being able to challenge some of the numbers that were put or challenge some of the assumptions or, oh, we're going to do this great. We're going to go to this show or hire this consultant and doing all those things, be able to challenge them and say, do we really need to do this? While you're still putting the, the document together, right? Because they're like, okay, you're supposed to just putting the number. 
Why are you challenging me? <laughs> Just take it. We're going to spend this money. Let's, let's do this. So it's being able to navigate through that. That's when I really learned what business partnering was. It was learning by fire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I certainly remember that one, trying to put together a zero-based budget on a coal-fired power station that really was... needed to control its costs. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had to challenge everything. And it became incredibly difficult because the engineers you're talking to, and most most of the budget was engineering, and they were spending money on lots of mm. very, very technical stuff. And mm -hmm. if I said, why do you need that? They'd give me some reason. Mm -hmm. It was so technical and complex and whatever. I had no clue whatsoever whether... Mm -hmm they were telling me about something that was a genuine spend or not, or whether it was mm -hmm. just the latest shiny object that some salesman had showed them that they really wanted the fancy fitting on the power station next year. Yes. Yes. And that's why spending time with them and learning their language and their challenges makes a big difference. By the yeah. time you get to budget season, you guys have talked throughout the year, you were in sync, you know what's going on. So that it doesn't go as bad. It's not as painful. But it does take a process and does take being intentional about building those bridges. Brilliant, brilliant. So I mentioned as I introduced you that this is, we're going to talk a little bit about 2023 and objectives going forward. I, mm -hmm. I know one of one of the things you like talking about is, is personal branding. If any of our listeners are feeling as though they need to work on their brand mm -hmm. this year, mm -hmm. what, what sort of advice would you be giving them? So first, I want everybody to have in mind that people will Google you and LinkedIn you before they work with you. What are you doing about what they will find? We work in a hybrid world now. And so a lot of people will go, you know, when you hire, let's say, into a new position, they didn't see your resume. They may go check out your LinkedIn. Whether you at work and you, you know, you have a meeting with someone, so they'll be like, oh, let me check what this person is about. They're going to Google or LinkedIn you. Because when you Google your name, the first thing that will show up probably your LinkedIn profile if you have one. What will they see? Will they see someone that's an expert or a thought leader in their field? Will they be able to see from your past position in your experience section, let's say on LinkedIn, what are some of the things you've done and how and what kind of value you can bring to the table? And so I think, unfortunately, personal branding is, you know, it's felt like something that's for marketers or entrepreneurs, you're trying to sell product. It's really about how you position yourself or whoever will be doing that search and how you're going to show up when they actually meet you. Because again, the two have to match. So very mm. important. If you're not thinking about it, you should, at least from the perspective of, okay, that in that next meeting, I challenge you to go and ask the people that you meet with you, how many of them have checked your LinkedIn profile? You'll be surprised. At some point, they did. Yeah. I'll check people's LinkedIn profiles all the time. And somebody says to me, oh, Kevin, can I be a guest on the Grow CFO show? First thing I'll do is go look at their LinkedIn profile. See? If I don't know them already and think, well, why, why should I be talking to this person? What have mm -hmm. they got to offer? What, mm -hmm. as you say, what makes them special? What gives them authority? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So thinking about that sort of thing, what's here, 2023, what's top of your list of personal objectives? Oh, gosh, I have a lot. So one, I already I want to learn more about ESG because I work for a chemical manufacturer and it's part of our strategic objectives for the coming year. So getting myself more immersed in that, I think it's key It's becoming more and more of a pressure, whether you are a public company or not to be able to say what you're doing from the environment, social, and government's perspective on a lot of the things that you do. So I've already signed up for different things and want to definitely dig even further into ESG and how it pertains to business and how it makes a difference, really, in yeah. the community that we operate in. I think ESG is going to be a big, big thing in 2023. And we put just before Christmas, we released a series of seven articles. They're on the, the insights page on the Grow CFO website. And one of those is all about ESG. And mm -hmm. I think it's going to be a really hot topic in this year. Yes. 
Yes. Uh, certainly, we're looking at that in Gross CFO. We're talking to various people about making sure we've got an ESG course built mm-hmm. into the, the membership area. I think we'll probably see some challenges coming up around ESG this year. Sorry, I've used the wrong word there. There's, we'll probably see some quests coming up around ESG. <laughs> this, this yes. Year. Things that you can do and really get into to to do something practical in your mm-hmm. organization about reporting ESG. So I think mm-hmm. yeah, I think that's probably going to be very high on a lot of people's radar. Yeah. Yes, it certainly so, is on mine. So what else is big on yours? Power BI and modeling. I really need to up my game in that area because the way technology is now embedded in what we do in finance. I just feel like we should all be looking into how we embrace it to bring more value to what we do. So definitely looking to uh, up my game on modeling in Power BI, for sure. That's another one. Funnily enough, another one of those articles on in, in the Insights page, predictions for 2023, is all about modeling and data. Mm-hmm. Sitting there as well, we've got playing a bigger and bigger part in things, artificial intelligence. And the sorts yes. of insights we're going to be able to get out of data in the next five years, I think is going to be mind-blowing. Mm-hmm. Yes. And that and the fact that finance is being pulled into so many directions, right? We, we're helping marketing, we're pricing, we're helping HR with sales, people, compensations and incentives, like we're helping with supply chain. We're involved in so much things, so much data when, that we need to provide insight on. So I think really understanding how that, that conversion from data to insight in a fa- at a faster pace uh, is very important. Yeah. Comes back to lifelong learning. Mm-hmm. Whatever yes. skills we've got today, we're going to need some different ones tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, some better ones. Yes. So yeah. so that so ESG uh, modeling and power BI. The other part for me is definitely to grow in my thought leadership on finance. One of the areas that I think we need to think more of is soft skills in finance, because yeah. like we talked about, we're moving away from some manual processes. We're getting more into business partnering and soft skills is like, yes, it's a must. It's a must. I mean, beyond Excel, beyond all the gap in IFRS standards, how you are able to bring yourself to work and make a difference matters a lot. Yeah. And I always remember as a youngster, advice I got from my, my own father, who was a, a partner in a small firm of public accountants. Okay. And he had a philosophy that said, basically, Kevin, never ask somebody else to do something you can't do yourself. Now, yes. that I think was great advice at the time. And they'd been preparing tax returns, doing audits for clients, statutory accounts. They'd been doing the same things for years and years mm-hmm. and years. But I, I think what I've, has really come home to me more recently is that as, a, as a, a senior finance person, you've got to have these days the opposite view because there is so much responsibility around you that you can't possibly have first rate skills in all of it your job as a leader is to mm-hmm. enable other people to get on and yes. do the best job they can in the areas that you're not a specialist in mm-hmm. so the th- three very very good objectives there for 2023 thank you yeah. what are yours see now I'm what curious. are mine um, I suppose, interesting situation that you know, we've got Grow CFO to a certain point at the end of 2022, and we're seeing a huge number of opportunities coming up in 2023. And I, I think one of those is going to be how do we grow the business mm-hmm. to a very good scale while retaining all of the values that we've got in the business around being a central to helping people, giving independent advice, mm-hmm. and you know, just maintaining a, a certain professional level. I think that's a, that's a big challenge going forward. And how do we do that sense of objective number two? 
got uh, two small small grandchildren Yay! and possibly more on the way. Don't know. We'll just have to wait and see what happens. But there's certainly an object in my mind that I've got to be the best granddad I can possibly be. Awesome. So they're, they're two key ones. And I think you know, even at my stage of career, I've got a lot more to learn about. And uh, just growing the business the way we are at the moment, there's, there's a new challenge every day. It's not necessarily mm-hmm. a finance one either. So I think there's something around making sure that I stay abreast of the, the skills that we need. Mm-hmm. That's I awesome. find myself doing, rather than a finance role these days, I find myself doing more of an operations role. And that's bringing a whole load of new and interesting challenges. So, yeah, yeah, I think the the lifelong learning thing is a is a real, real big one. Yes. 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 We have to stay updated. I don't know that there is any other way. Yeah. Yeah. So thinking about being a a mentor, Mm -hmm. what sort of person would be your ideal mentee? It will be someone that wants to grow and yeah. learn because i've you know in my experience i've met a lot of people they say they want to do they want to grow but they don't put anything in practice and you know as a mentor like i'm putting my heart like i i'm rooting for you i want you to succeed i want you to do all these things and then you have people that are like oh well no they're not doing it so yeah that hurts my feeling <laughs> so having someone that's very motivated and willing to put in the work to reach their dreams and because that's a that's one of the best fulfillment for me as a mentor is to see them succeed so get that absolutely so beyond the mentee really being keen to go do things and succeed is there any mm-hmm. particular type of person beyond that do you would you favor mentoring women over men or doesn't it make no. any difference no, it doesn't make any difference. I've mentored both. One of my recent mentees, she was working in the military, transitioning after 20 years to accounting and finance. And, you know, when we started speaking, she was like, well, maybe I need to take a, a small role in accounts receivable. And I was like, no, you've been leading in the military for 20 years. You have transferable skills. You have insights that we need in corporate finance and accounting. So she was able to lend uh, three different job offers. And I was like, yay, so excited on how she, you know, revamped her resume and changed the whole her whole attitude of, of how she was coming to the interview process and all that. So I don't think being a man or woman makes a difference to me. It's really down to what are you willing to do to mm. reach those goals. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, sir, it has been fantastic talking to you uh-huh. on this week's Gross CFO show. Thank you for being a brilliant guest. Thank you so much, Kevin. Much appreciated. Thanks for having me. Thank you.